Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you to all of you for coming in this uh, hard weather. Um, I'm sure it was a bit of a struggle to get here, but we have a very distinguished panel for you tonight. Um, Jeff Dyer, Ms. Schillinger and Justin Goh. Um, Jeff Dyer, as I'm sure you all know, is a novelist and essayist, a British uh, critic also, and more than that, was born in Cheltenham, uh, England, and has written a number of books, novels, um, and non-fiction, and um, yeah, created his latest novel was Death in Varanasi, uh, and his latest book was called Song, if I'm can I pronounce it rightly? Uh, well, Azona. So, Azona, oh, I have it wrong here. Um, and, and he has a new book coming out uh, in the US and UK here this spring in May, Another Great Day at Sea, um, which is about the life aboard the USS George H.W. Bush. And he's translated into 24 languages. Um, then we have in the middle, Liesl Schillinger, um, a literary uh, expert New York based translator and moderator critic who grew up in um, I have it as Midwestern college towns whatever that exactly <laughs> means <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and studied comparative literature at Yale and has worked at the New Yorker for more than a decade and became a regular critic for the New York Times book review in 2004 and her articles and essays have appeared in the New Yorker, the New York Times, New York, the New Republic, the Washington Post, Vogue and Foreign Policy, uh, and, and others. And uh, I think she might be our real literary expert here. Um, and at the end, we have Justin Goh, who was born in Los Angeles and studied art and history at the University of California, uh, Berkeley, and has an MA in English. Um, from London and The Steady Running of the Hour is his first novel that was just published here 15 April and it's uh, going to be published in 20 languages already so it's quite a sensation um, and both Jeff Dyer and Justin Go have written extensively on uh, or Justin is his first book on the First World War uh, but Jeff has written various books, but particularly also on, on this war. And tonight the way we do it is uh, each of the panelists will start with a short statement on their approach to the subject matter, uh, five minutes. Then we're going to discuss all uh, this um, and also discuss a lot about what war literature can uh, do and does do both to writers and, and readers and the world as such. And we'll be reading a little piece of war literature, uh, each panelist, and at the end, we'll take questions from you if you have any. Um, so you can take note if you want. If there's anything interesting, you will have a chance to ask our great panelists here. And Jeff, will you start? Yeah, with, with great pleasure. Thank you all for coming and for that nice introduction. Um, <clears throat> we thought I would go first to provide a bit of context really about uh, about the First World War um, and there was a slight danger it seems uh, I know Jana was worried that we might start talking academically uh, that was never really a, a possibility in my, in my case um, I was born in 1958 uh, which means that my childhood was dominated culturally absolutely by the Second World War in comics, TV shows, books, everything, family reminiscences. It, was, it seemed like the Second World War was being sort of replayed um, fictitiously throughout my childhood. And in a sense, I feel that my childhood came to an end when I got a deeper, proper historical understanding of the Second World War which came in the form of that great, that amazing documentary series, still one of the greatest documentary series ever made, The World at War. Uh, so, that, I'm aware, sorry, I haven't gone mad. I know we are meant to be talking about the First World War. Um, and, but I think it's, it was quite interesting that behind that war, there was this kind of deep 
constant awareness, this kind of geological presence of the First World War. Uh, but it wasn't being represented in the culture in the, in the way that the Second World War was. Uh, but at the same time, it was, it was all pervasive and it was incredibly personal. Um, uh, and, you know, I have, uh, just looking at the sort of average age of people here, here I, was, I have such a vivid memory of my friend Gary Hunt and I being round at his granddad's house. And almost every time we were around there, his granddad would drop his trousers and show us his shrapnel wounds from the, from the First World War. Um, and, I mean, you know, what this means is I had this deep, personal, living connection with the, with, with the First World War. Uh, you know, it was deep, but at the same time it was quite routine and domestic. And, okay, I said that I was born in 1958. I think this tended to be happening round about when I was 10, so that would be 1968. So I think it's just worth bearing these dates in mind. So 1968, let's say, that was when the trouser dropping was going on. But I sound like this is some sort of inquiry at the Vatican or something. You know? and, uh, but I mean, what it means is that, that was, this was taking place 50 years after the armistice, a gap of 50 years between 1918, when the First World War ended, and 1968 when this was going on. And I find that extraordinary. What is extraordinary about that for me is that that, was act that is actually 20 years nearer the end of you know, my, that, that experience then than we are now to the end of the Second World War. Uh, there are certain other depressing conclusions we can draw from that about just how quickly my own life has, has, has gone by. But uh, yeah, so it was, it, there was this kind of incredible proximity to it. But weirdly, although the Second World War was being imaginatively replayed and recreated in films like Where Eagles Dare and all that kind of stuff, the First World War always felt at the same time really like it belonged in the realm of memory. And I think the reason for that is very simple, is because if you grow up in, in England, uh, these memorials and the whole procedures of remembrance uh, you know that thing that you get on uh, on Armistice Day every you know on the 11th of November every year these memorials are all over Britain they're in not just every town but in every little village and I think one of the incredible things for me as I've grown up and become an adult and traveled is the way that if you go you know this really was a world war so you can be in some tiny, you can be in Australia, you know, and there's that amazing uh, memorial in Sydney to the Anzacs. And it's an incredibly moving memorial. I mean, I, I, I'm always, one of the things that's sort of off-putting about the uh, uh, memorials in Britain, so often they say that the stone was laid by, you know, Her Royal Highness, Queen, whatever, which if you're a Republican in the European sense of the word, really sticks in the craw and it's so moving at the Anzac Memorial in Sydney to come across the inscriptions there there's two stones uh, it says this stone was laid by a soldier of the Great War and it's paired with another one which says this stone was laid by a citizen it's really incredibly moving that's one of the big memorials sorry I didn't realize that I know there's medication available for this ailment um, uh, and, uh, but of course it's not just in Sydney, you go to some tiny village in Australia or New Zealand and these memorials are everywhere. I think as well, I mean, just to begin linking it with the theme of, 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 the, uh, of the night which is, which is writing about the, uh, the First World War, and this is the note I'll end on, um, you know, so, so we're growing up with these, with this, with the sort of first memories of the First World War everywhere, and then in British schools, it's not unusual. My, my case was not unusual. My introduction to poetry of any kind was to a very specific kind of poetry. It was the poetry of Wilfred Owen. So, in a weird way, for me, poetry kind of manifested itself as anti-war poetry, and I think, you know, this is really, this is really coloured. Uh, the way that the, uh, the, the First World War has been perceived by me, and uh, I'll say something more about the, uh, the, the particular uh, sort of British writing about the First World War when we've heard from other people, but for now that, that's it from me. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Deb. I think we'll move on straight. That was a beautiful introduction to, to Liesl, and, and we'll talk more yeah. afterwards, yeah. All right, and uh, unlike Jeff, unlike most Americans, really any Americans, I didn't grow up surrounded by intimations of World War I. I grew up in Vietnam era America, uh, where there was, if anything, a memory of the previous World War, European War, World War II, not of the first one. Um, but I came upon my early fascination, which has lingered with the First World War uh, in a kind of stealthy way. It crept up on me. Um, as a, a Midwesterner, um, I, I grew up uh, with a mother who loved the American Civil War, and she grew up in Springfield, Illinois, where Lincoln was from. And she wanted me to love uh, Carl Sandburg's poem about Lincoln, and uh, she gave me this book of American poets, and I was maybe nine, nine or 10 when I read it. But instead of being moved by all the poems by the American poets about America, I was moved by the poems by the American poets about the First World War. I was weeping, I was nine years old, we lived in Indiana at the time, and was reading uh, in Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place. You know, this is the clichéest thing in the world, but wars are fought for clichés, and, and actually love grows out of it, and these immediate strong uh, emotions uh, had such power for me. I was captivated by the, the sacrifice. Uh, another poem that absolutely uh, stayed with me was I Have a Rendezvous with Death by an American named Alan Seeger who volunteered to go and serve, uh, to fight the Central Powers with the French. Other Americans uh, also, I learned, volunteered to go and, and fight in this war, uh, like Ernest Hemingway, who was a volunteer ambulance driver, like E.E. E. Cummings, who wrote an amazing book called The Enormous Room, like uh, John Dos Passos. He, he, he was an ambulance driver in France. It's, it's surprising, the poets particularly, who were drawn to fight in this war, and the writers. And as a writerly person, uh, myself, even from the earliest age, uh, their imaginative engagement with that war compelled me. And I learned French from the age of 10 and then German at 12 because I wanted to understand this strange connection uh, that we had with this war over there. And, uh, you know, recently I, I read, Jeff wrote an amazing uh, book of, called The Missing of the Sum, which was his reaction to this obsession with uh, memory of that war, almost an anticipation of the memory by the people who wrote about it before it happened. There's a stirring sentence in his book where he talks about how when you saw the, old, the soldiers walking in procession around the Cenotaph in London, which is a memorial and commemoration to the dead of that war. The people marching aren't marching as soldiers, they're marking as embodiments of the slain, of the fallen. And it's all kind of, uh, it's, it's spine tingling. And uh, anything that I read about this literature, about this era, uh, anything I read in literature or watch in the films and movies and TV shows that have been inspired by this war uh, does tend to raise strong feelings of emotion uh, that linger. And why do we read and watch if not to be powerfully affected? That's why the war has this hold on me. Okay. Thank you, Liz Kenyosa. Do you think these writers were drawn in because it was at a time where we didn't know so much, so people had the mythology of the war, which is, I think, always a draw on writers? Um, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you now. I'm well, you know, you. when the war, in, when the First World War had happened, uh, I think in August of 1914, uh, there hadn't been a war on European soil since the Franco-Prussian War, which was 1870, 71. And so all of these well-educated people in Europe and in America who got the same kind of educations had been stirred by reading Horace, by reading the war poets. By, they had this idealism, and they wanted to serve and Wilfred Owen, of course, exposed that in his poem, Dolce et Decorum Est, which they can talk about. But I think the same things that moved the Europeans who wrote about the war, and here I'm talking about the poets more than I'm talking about the soldier writers who wrote grueling accounts of their war experiences. But I think that the initial draw to the, the war was 
heroic on the part of Americans and on the part of Europeans. I'm, of course, speaking of not of this. Even the Germans felt that way too. Initially, uh, yeah. The, um, I, I just want to read one thing and then I'll stop, which is just that uh, there's a book that's coming out in May called Fear by New York Review Books by Gabriel Chevalier. And he, it's a book written in 1930 by a man, a Frenchman, who was admitting cowardice, admitting fear, not making war look like a triumphant enterprise. And he described himself as he's going into this war in 1914 with all this gusto, just kind of wanting to see, to prove himself. And he says, men are sheep. This fact makes armies and wars possible. They die the victims of their own stupid docility. When you've seen war as I have seen it, you ask yourself, how can we put up with such a thing? What frontier traced on a map? What national honor could possibly justify it? How can what is nothing but banditry be dressed up as an ideal and allowed to happen? They told the Germans, forward to a bright and joyous war, on to Paris, God is with us for a greater Germany. And the good, peaceful Germans who take everything seriously set forth to conquer, transforming themselves into savage beasts. They told the French, the nation is under attack. We will fight for justice and retribution. On to Berlin. And the pacifist French, the French who take nothing at all seriously, interrupted their modest little rentier reveries to go and fight. So it was with the Austrians, the Belgians, the English, the Russians, the Turks, and then the Italians. In a single week, 20 million men, busy with their lives and loves, with making money and planning a future, received the order to stop everything to go and kill other men. And those 20 million individuals obeyed the order because they had been convinced that this was their duty. That's setting up the war. We'll get back to you again there. Thanks, Justin. <clears throat> um, well, it's a great honor to be here uh, among such eminent writers. Um, I am coming at it from sort of a personal perspective in, in the sense that I, I wrote a, a novel that's set in this period, but there was nothing in my background or education that would have you know, suppose that this would have happened. I grew up in Los Angeles, which is sunny and very distant from Picardy or Pastendale. Um, and I was fascinated by this, but I had no, you know, none of my family members that I know fought in the war or anything like that. But I always found it really interesting. And I think that there's a persistent fascination, which is why, you know, I, it's amazing that 100 years later we can get a room full of people to, to hear about the literature of the war um, because it made such an impact. And I guess on a personal quality, I mean, I first read you know, All Quiet on the Western Front when I was 13 years old or whatever in high school, and it kind of just stuck with me. And I think part of it was this sort of the nightmarish quality that we all kind of associate with, where the, the, the machines that we had been building as a civilization on this supposed march towards progress turned against us, which I found really fascinating in the, the mud and the trenches. And, and when you read about it and you research it, and I spent six or seven years immersed in this trying to recreate it, you realize that, well, a lot of the stereotypes are somewhat accurate. Um, but the other thing that really drew me to it was the beauty, the beauty of the language, especially the letters, um, poetry and all that stuff. Um, I, I still, I'm sure we'll be talking about it on this panel, with why did the war produce such stuff that's so amazing? Um, I don't even know if I can answer that question, but I think it's pretty indisputable that it did. Um, and I, I think there was also a, a kind of an amazing mystery to the war. It was a war where you didn't see your enemy, um, where the, the, you know, if you were an English soldier, you would not have seen the Germans very often, and generally only at great distances, even if you could hear them. Um, so I, I was reading, I started reading all kinds of things, and I think um, if we're talking about the war, I, I, I suspect this will be the same for, maybe for Jeff Muesel, but I didn't even differentiate between actual literature, which is diary, memoirs, or something like that, and and letters, which have now become, I think, part of the way that we view the war. And letters for me became a, kind of a, an intimate way of experiencing it. And, you know, you begin to feel, feel attached to these people. I read all of from Owen's letters, and, and then that was sort of the, the beginning point. And you keep going, and you keep going, and after a while you can't believe that, you know, it was a hundred years ago. Um, and the, the one thing I want to, I'm going to read one thing that I've, I found very early on in, um, my research, which is from the novel The Middle Parts of Fortune, if you know it, by Frederick Manning, who was an Australian, who wrote this book that's probably, I think, the greatest novel of the First World War. Um, it's, it was originally published, actually, as a, anonymously. Um, it's a book called Her Private Suite, and there was no, 
attribution, and then later it was attributed just to his, this soldier's number. But the preface of the book, he says, war is waged by men, not by beasts or by gods. It is a peculiarly human activity. To call it a crime against humanity is to miss at least half its significance. It is also the punishment of crime. So um, what I'll be talking about tonight is probably, because I'm not an expert in the literature as much as I've tried to read, it's, it's just the experience of trying to be faithful and to, to what happened and what the experience of that was like, because a lot of it still meant going to this literature um, time and again. Mm. Can I just ask you one question? I presume you've been reading um, a lot about the world you know, while you were writing your book. Um, did you find that more recent writing about the Great War looks at it in a whole different way than, than earlier writing? Um, I'm probably the worst person to ask about that because I actually tried not to read anything written after 1930 <laughs> because I didn't want my ideas of, of the war to be mixed up with, with other ideas. It's kind of a funny thing because I had read some of this stuff beforehand, um, but I, I, you know, before I started the book, but then I didn't for a really long time. And now I, right before this panel, I, I was like, oh, well, the book's done. I can read, I can read stuff. So I read Jeff's book again, and I was like, oh, this is so great. I didn't even know that other people had written all this stuff. <laughs> but I actually, one thing that I found in his book that I really enjoyed, it, it, he said, um, every generation since the armistice has believed it will be the last for whom the Great War has any meaning. Um, and obviously I'm a subsequent generation and I think there's going to be a persistence to it. So probably that, that lens of memory, I'm sure, has, has totally changed it. Yeah, it feels so. So I'll take that question on to you, Jeff. Uh, that how do you see the world literature changing generation after generation? And now we're talking about the world literature about the Great War. Yeah, sure. Well, just to, to pick up with that about that point of Justin's, you know, there when I was saying that I was fearing that mine would be the last generation for whom the <clears throat> First World War had that kind of res resonance, I was very conscious that I was just the latest person in a long, long line of people worrying that it would be forgotten. And one of the things that, um, uh, that, that I noticed is that from such an early stage, people were worrying about whether this cataclysmic, this huge event would be remembered. And there was a very characteristic way of doing this. They'd say, no, people are gonna forget. They're gonna forget the shelling, the gassing, the blah, blah, blah. And they'd go through this kind of litany of all the things which they said would be forgotten thereby kind of negatively imprinting all this stuff on the memory. And it's really striking uh, when, you read, uh, 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 when you read the literature, I think, is how nearly every book, they sort of, they make certain sort of tropes have to be there. Uh, and it's really remarkable. I mean, this book that, uh, that the NYRB are not being paid by them to. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, uh, it was published, I think, in 1930, and as I understand it, it was perhaps, perhaps, perhaps rather over, it sort of, it was maybe sort of cast in the shadow by All Quiet on the Western Front. It's really a, an amazing book, um, and I'm just struck by the way it covers all the kind of, all the kind of themes that, that we come across in Remark and Wil Wilfred Owen and everyone else. Anyway, so that, that's one point, this constant, so there was I, this, you know, latest, Warrior about the uh, the way that it might be forgotten. I think what's happened. I mean, it turns out I got that completely wrong. Uh, particularly here in America, when my book came out back in the nineteen nineties, <clears throat> in American. Well, let me sort of in 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 England, military history is an entirely respectable category of of history, and I so remember in the nineteen nineties when I asked a woman in a bookstore in San Francisco where the military history section was. I could see, sort of see her saying, uh, it's over there in the fuck off you fascist pig section. <laughs> you know, uh, so, uh, I, okay, so not only was it not so uh, respectable as a, as a category, but also in the little section of military history there was, it was very striking. There would be, be of course, the American Civil War then where the First World War would occupy in England a huge amount of sh shelf, there was this absence. Perhaps they'd have Paul Fussell's The Great War and Modern Memory, then there'd be the Spanish Civil War, and then of course there'd be the Second World War. I mean, what's happened, I think, in the last 20 years, 
And I think the things that change this, it would be the John Keegan book and the Neil Ferguson book. Uh, the First World War sort of now exists in, uh, in the American curriculum in a way that it, that it didn't 20, 20 years ago. Uh, I don't, well, I suppose, yeah, let me, uh, let me, let me, uh, is, that, is that correct or incorrect, fair or unfair? I would, I would say it is fair, but I think this, this is coming from on the basis of no academic scholarship. This is just an impression. But I think that uh, the movie Saving Private Ryan in America's awareness of the Second World War made people more aware of the World War's resonance and I think, as a theme for fiction and film. And I think that we become more Eurocentric in our, in our thinking. I think that the end of the Cold War hastened that as well. Uh, although, although who knows what's going to happen now uh, with what's going on with you know Crimea uh, back in play and all of that. But um, you know, I, I, one thing that you said in your book, The Missing of the Sum, that I think was spot on, was that there isn't much of a photographic record of, or film record of the First World War, so we can't picture it. And the eloquent poets made us visualize it, and the writers have made it come alive. But there isn't the full, we can walk, you write, we can watch men invading Normandy and D-Day. You know, so there was a present visual reality that everyone could grab on to, and for the Americans at least, because we it wasn't fought on our soil, World War I. There was a present reality, apart from Hawaii, in all of the photographic and video. Uh, Lisa, can I pick, pick up on that um, and ask, no, no Lisa, if, how do you see the First World War literature compared to the Second World War? I mean, you were evidently drawn somewhere to that slight romantic tone of the mythologizations that happened around the First World War that I don't think is, personally, I don't think is in the literature after the Second World War, but how do you see it? Or well, I mean, uh, I mean, I hate to refer to Paul Fussell, but uh, in his book, The Great War in Modern Memory, he talks about the fact that people act as if there was this golden, sunny, perfect, ideal humanity, the summer of 1914 that was ended by uh, the First World War and everything was sort of destroyed and people nostalgically look back to the past that was created. You touch on that too, but there's a way in which I think that's true. I mean, look at people freaking out at Downton Abbey. Look at what happened when upstairs, downstairs, George, Georgina becomes a bad, that's a volunteer nurse and, and one of her, the point is that there's a way in which uh, there's, there, there are, it was, there were sheer ideals of noble self-sacrifice that prompted all of these people to go and become cannon fodder and women to go to horrifically uncomfortable hospitals and to deal with severed limbs and gangrene and to be blown up by, in boats as they went to Greece to work in distant uh, hospitals. There was a, a really altruistic aim that a lot of people felt. And in World War II, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't finish that thought, but no one even now can really say what World War I was for. <laughs> you know, it's just this strange explosion that erupted and destroyed Europe, from which Europe really never recovered, certainly on, with World War II on top of that, that destroyed a way of life. And, and the ideal of human perfectibility and decency that people took into World War I, I don't think they took into World War II. World War II people entered to stop a horrific, uh, disproportionate violence by the Germans, and then, of course, we all know Everything that happened. Could I also still, uh, no, I, I think somewhere the mythologization has also been allowed because um, the First World War was it's a Western phenomenon. I mean, if you've lived in the colonies or um, elsewhere in the world, you wouldn't have this ideal perspective of the European man and his honorable um, ways of behaving. Um, but somewhere, yeah, it was at that very moment. Um, that was a pervasive mood when you were in, in, the, in the West. Um. Well, I think that it'd be hard to generalize about the motivations because, well, first of all, they were changing. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that there was a lot of, certainly there was a concept of duty that might be different from what we had. But I think it, what you get from a lot of the literature is the feeling that simply people didn't have any choice. I mean, if... Uh, even even soldiers like Sassoon, who famous, famously wrote a declaration saying that he was no, not going to fight any longer, was the people who rebelled didn't really fully rebel in the way we would think of, you know? It was very reticent. And so I think a lot of people were caught in between their sense of duty and, and um, you know, 
their duty to their men, for one thing. It was not so easy, even if you were against the war, to, to just say that you, you weren't going to go back. And, um, and uh, a, probably a culture that, that didn't have um, any kind of familiarity with like what we would think of as conscientious objectors would have been very much on the periphery you know, in a way that I think is very different from something like the Vietnam War. Well, if you think of Regeneration by Pat Barker, the shame that Sassoon felt for, he, what made that declaration, which you also mentioned in your book, and I don't want to, I'm the least interesting person here, so I, I don't want to suck up mm -hmm. microphone time, but just to talk about uh, the shame they felt. Siegfried Sassoon, Robert Graves literally went to fight to keep Siegfried Sassoon from uh, making his declaration of war more public than it was, and he hoped that he would rally and go back to war because no one could bear the stigma of not having been brave enough to fight for them. Yeah, yeah it's, it is really interesting, this, and I think you're absolutely right, Justin, to say how you can't generalize, because for me, one of the really interesting uh, sort of national differences is on the one hand, yeah, you get this kind of great body of um, sort of uh, protest writing from the, from the officer class, in, uh, in Britain, Sassoon, Owen, Graves, the, the, these people. Um, you get maybe a few, uh, a, a few desertions, but you don't get what you get in the French army, army which is these huge mutinies, uh, which were only stopped by, um, <clears throat> you know, by that sort of practice of decim, uh, often by the practice of, of, of decimation. Um, and you know, then you, but then there's this sort of weird meeting between the two, the two, but the British and the, the French versions of things, whereby you get that incredible thing that crops up towards the, I can't remember in what, in what year, but it's after the mutinies, when you get the French armies, get the French soldiers going to the front, and they're all just going, bah, bah, to indicate that they're lambs to the slaughter. And that idea of, of the kind of passive suffering is something which is so prevalent, and this is what Fussell writes about um, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the writing of the British officer class. And I just say one more sort of universal, strange sort of a thing which is both universal and particular, which I think we, we might end up discussing. Um, partly because of the way that we came across the First World War at school in England, that is to say not really by history books, but by these fiction writers. And the kind of, the argument in brief was that it was, uh, you know, lions led by donkeys, it was all completely pointless. I guess that to put it in a word, the title of the Wilfred Owen poem, Futility, it was all, all for nothing. And I think it's a, an extraordinary thing with the First World War that every nation's experience of it is very, very particularized or localized. So if I ask you to think of the Second World War, you'll, you'll sort of think of all sorts of things, Normandy, of course, but also Stalingrad, this kind of thing. Now, it seems to me that with the First World War, each nation's experience of it can be pinned down much more specifically. So. If you're French, it's of course the meat grinder of Verdun, and throughout this this you know this wonderful book, uh, uh, wherever this guy is, you know, Verdun is the constant point of reference. If it's going well, if it's going quite well, they say, oh God, you know, thank God we're not in Verdun. Then it goes really bad, and he says, yeah, this is a glimpse of what Verdun was like. For the Australians or the New Zealand troops, it's of course Gallipoli, the great cataclysm of Gallipoli. For Britain, of course, it's the Song or Passchendaele. And it's quite an interesting thing, really. That, and these are the things that are most, uh, that are most, sort of most heavily remembered. They're, they're, they tend to be defeats. They tend to be uh, defeats which are the product of incredible incompetence and um, uh, um, sort of stupid, stupid conception. You know, Passchendaele, let's bomb this muddy stuff, and then it means, every, you know, anyway, it's just, it's, catalog like that. But each country, it seems, sort of glorifies in their greatest defeat. So that the Somme, you know, which is this cataclysmic thing, becomes the defining, you know, uh, British thing of when we say the Somme, the First World War, they're almost synonymous. And I guess then we think of the exception to this might be, I guess, Germany, because of course, well, they just lost the whole thing. Um, and then I guess, I would think, so just thinking of, of, of America again, and you know, when I was writing my book, I was struck by the way that the, the cataclysm of the Somme and all this sort of stuff led to this, all sorts of things like these procedures of remembrance, the, the very scrupulous recording of all of the dead, and you know, all this kind of stuff. What I hadn't quite realized is that 
so many of these things have been put in put in place by the you know uh, the incredible experience of this republic of suffering as that Gilpin Faust book is called of the American Civil War and it was in the American Civil War I realized I've realized now that that uh, sort of very modern conception of war where, where there's a lot of just passively getting blown to bits, huge kind of um, numbers of people whose bodies just got sort of vaporized by, by, by bombardment, this kind of stuff. Really struck by the way that that was prefigured by the American Civil War, which unlike these cataclysmic events of the battles of the First World War, had a kind of, you know, an obvious reason, justification, and a sort of positive outcome. And I think that might be another reason as well why for so long the First World War didn't figure so largely in American bookshelves. Maybe I could come, you didn't get a chance to reply to that little <laughs> sort of claim of mine at the beginning, Justin. I wondered if you wanted to um, correct me on any of this latest. Um, well, I mean, I think for Americans, obviously, the Americans entered the war late, and, um, well, of course, we didn't, we didn't, it wasn't our soil. I mean, there's the proximity of, the, for, for the British, I think the proximity of the war was just an, an incredible, it made it so different. You could hear the guns from, from, from southern England, parcels to, and letters would go back within a matter of days. And for the Americans, this was something that it took, even once the machine started going, a, a very long time before the troops finally arrived. Um, so I think, I think that sense of insulation and the fact that Americans have wanted to be insulated probably, probably um, affected it. But I, I don't, you know, I'm not... I'm actually more familiar with the British experience, which is sort of messed up. <laughs> what if, unfortunately, I've read so many books in the last few weeks that I'm not sure why I read this one. Uh, but there's a, a book came out April 15th by John Baxter, who is a, an Australian Francophile, lives in France. And uh, it's called Paris at the End of the World. And I think it's his book, but it might be yours. Uh, or it might be uh, Russell, I don't know. But uh, he talks about how when the French went into the war in Europe, they had rigged up all of their little armies uh, to go towards the Western Front, kind of like a child might play with soldiers on his bedspread. They didn't know about reconnaissance planes. They didn't understand about artillery. It was just a joke. You know, They went to be slaughtered trying to keep up the old lines that had worked for them in the past. And I'm wondering if the Americans, maybe in the Civil War, had more of a sense of what they're about to face. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, I really, yeah, I think that thing of the American Civil War as a sort of, uh, as a deterrent and also a, a kind of uh, a kind of precursor of what would, uh, a sort of warning a, a, about what would come is really, really quite, quite important. Well, the funny thing about all wars is that nobody generally thinks that they're going to be either as bad or as long as they turn out being. I mean, it's sort of, Probably one of the reasons why the war deserves commemoration, maybe the greatest reason, is that, is that hum humans are incredibly short-sighted. They always think it's going to be easier. They don't really think it's going to be that bad. The Great War just seems to stand out as the most impressive example of this like, failure of imagination to see what it was like. Because if they had been paying attention to the, to the, civil, the American Civil War, they would have seen um, the mechanization, um, defensive positions, trenches, and all these things. They were there, and, and vast citizen armies being slaughtered um, you know, in a, in a war of attrition that went on basically until society almost collapsed. But, you know, the, of course their, their experience was like the Franco-Prussian War and things like that, which were, were, which were not to the same degree. And so there were all kinds of reasons, but even if the conflict had been shorter, I, I still think that's part of, I mean, that's, that's why we remember it though, is that, that ignorance which seems so unbelievable now um, to, to I, it's funny, that seems so unbelievable now, and yet, I, I don't know, I, I can't say that, Whenever you know, when the Middle Eastern conflicts started in the '90s or whatever, when the U.S. is considering invasions, that you know, there's a, I, I feel like there's sometimes still the same, the same um, level of it's lack. Well, the the lack of imagination. I think Sassoon says in his declaration that the callous complacency with which the majority um, uh, persistent, uh, the, the lack of imagination about you know the agonies they do not share. Um, yeah. I mean, um, Fossil has said this, every war is ironic because every war is worse than expected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, we sit here and talk about, we're still sending people out, you know, to Afghanistan or even as they are taking the, the troops back now, but people are fighting as we sit here speaking and in wars that are even more horrible today. And it's difficult for us who have not 
been fighting to imagine what it is, even when we can see it on TV. Um, but, um, I want to get back to this thing with the difference of cultures and the experience of war, because I have, um, in my family, and my grandfather was from Germany, and he was uh, drafted into the First World War. Uh, he had been born in um, the year 1900, and on his 18 years birthday, he got the draft and was with rudimentary training sent to the front and had this experience of going with the train down, just knowing exactly that, you know, there were going to be cannon fodder on the train to the way back, came, you know, the bodies and the few people who survived but shot into pieces. He had then the luck that when he got to the front, it was early November, uh, and just as he was going to the fighting, um, the war was called on. And there in Germany, there was no way to be transported back. He was from Norman, uh, Northern Germany. So the young men, they were walking and yeah, trying to ride on the um, roofs of trains to get home for Christmas. And he managed somehow. And then he sold uh, his boots uh, shortly after. And for, with 20 d marks in his pocket, he walked to Denmark because he didn't want to be German anymore. Um, but yeah, there was this sense of duty, this that uh, you are drafted in and there's no way you can, you can deal with it. And even the Second World War, for the Germans at least, I think where the culture is so duty bound, um, it was the same kind of thing. Um, there's a wonderful, well, disgusting and horrifying, but wonderfully written passage in a book called Under Fire written by a man named Henri Barus, and that's a, that's a book that is mentioned in for, for Whom the Bell Tolls. It's mentioned by Robert Graves. Siegfried Sassoon read it and gave it to Wilfred Owen. It's a very influential novel of uh, the French War, written in 1916. And there's an ep episode very early on where a soldier is boasting about how he got some nice boots off a dead German, and he had to shake the boots, and then finally came off with the leg in it, parts of it, and he scrambled to get them out. And, uh, you know, it's it's... But the man says it with good humor. But you know, I, I was surprised by the modernity so early on of the of the voice and the resignation and the the kind of Sassoonian uh, attitude. This was in 1916 already that book. And that was in French. So do you find a difference then when you read the books of the first world from the different countries? I mean, from the German, the French, because my my experience with what I know is that Germans tend to focus more, of course, of the individual story. I mean, I guess if you are on the losing end, you don't want to talk too much about the bigger picture where so the Anglo-Saxon stories are more heroic. But I don't know, you know more about me, well, about, me about this. Yeah, I don't think they are more heroic. I mean, I think one of the reasons for the kind of universal success of um, All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, of course, he's speaking there about uh, the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the German experience of defeat. Uh, I think it's Modris Eckstein who says that actually it's really not so much a book about the First World War. I mean, that sounds a bit kind of crazy, but like that. He says it's about the sort of the. Uh, it's really about the the makeup of the post-war the post-war mind. And I think the thing is really for let's say for for Britain and France, who notionally won, but really the price had been so high that it was a victory that was all but indistinguishable from defeat, really. So I think there's nothing very heroic, really, about the narratives that spring immediately to mind of the of, of the uh, the British or, or French experience. Uh, and it, in in this one, that's there's certainly it, this is sort of a book about about cowardice in, in, in a way, isn't it? And there's this kind of incredible bit where they they work out this lovely sort of live and let live policy with the Germans and then an officer comes and sort of destroys this kind of peace they've, ma they've managed to erect. Um, yeah, I'm really struggling to think of any sort of outright heroic narratives except insofar as just being, to en just being able to endure it and put up with it constitutes a kind of heroism. Um, yeah, but I mean, also it's more like the underlying current that when you have been on the winning side in something that's seen as just, I mean, maybe it's more obvious on the Second World War, uh, then you will tell the narrative different that even, of course, there's a fear, of course, there's uh, on strong, but still it's, you were on the winning side. I think in a way, maybe it's even opened more up that you can talk about your own personal cowardice, uh, mm -hmm. the suffering, there just is another undercurrent. 
I don't know where, how do you, do you I was, see it? If you're talking about heroism in the literature of the war, the most striking examples of that are in, in emotions before the war actually started happening. Yeah. Rupert Brooke's poetry, which is loved and better known than Wilfred Owen's, but, but which most people are kind of sickened by it because it was this, talking about men leaping into war as if being cleansed. What is the? Oh, like swimmers into cleanness leaping, isn't oh. it? But you know, the people in 1914 who read that were so moved by Rupert Brooke. And so he, he, his, poet, his collection of poems 1914 was, was put forward, put forth by the British government as to encourage the people, uh, the, the citizenry to feel invested in the war. Then there was a lady who wrote something about the, the little mother. A woman wrote an essay about how, how proud she was to sacrifice her sons to the war. Uh, that was very big, but um, that was early in the war. But you know, one of my favorite writers of the First World War was Vera Britton, uh, a, a, a British girl whose fiance, brother, and best friends, they were all killed, all killed. And she was one of the first women to go to Oxford. Middle class girls didn't really go and get college educations. But the first 150 pages of her memoir, Testament of Youth, are just infused with the ridiculous love of heroism and the idealism of the boys, and she was chiding Roland, her fiance, for not having enough idealism to go into the war with total confidence that their cause was right, but then you see her change. Mm -hmm. But yeah. so, I, after the war, I don't see a lot of... Oh. Well, I, I, I agree with Jeff that I, I think that it was a war that no, nobody really won. I mean, it, the, certainly the, the literature that prevailed and, and, and shaped our view of it is the, is, the, is the literature in which everybody lost. That's, I think, the that's what you see in All Quiet on the Western Front. That's what you see in Goodbye to All That, Robert Graves' memoirs. That's what you see in Sassoon. That's what you see in uh, the major poets. Um, I'm thinking of the, the, the American stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you start digging into this stuff, or when I did, I found that there were a lot of books. I mean, there was a huge amount of this literature that all sort of came out in the late 1920s. And I don't know, I think, I suspect, though I don't know, that there were a lot of books that were different, that were less anti-war, but I think that the ones that stayed with us that shaped our views are these books. And in the end, uh, I think that was sort of a, the, the great victory of, well, of Wilfred Owen, you could say, was that, that Rupert Brooke um, was entered in 1914, the war, the most promising young man in poetry, you know, this, this guy who was beautiful and was friends with the Bloomsbury Group, and Wilfred Owen was what, like a, a guy who had been teaching in France at the Berlitz School and like knew nobody. And he became this, the great poet of the, of the First World War and Rupert Brooke was dead. And now um, we kind of admire his poetry but sort of laugh at it. Um, and I, I think that that was, that was sort of the, the victory of, of, the, of the literature, but then of course it also overshadows the fact that many people did fight in the war and wrote accounts that were much, I don't know, I mean some people are at pains to point out that it wasn't all mud and death and that we sometimes had fun. Yeah, and just to, I mean, just to, I mean, this book is so amazing. I, I'm really <laughs> struck by, uh, by, I'd love to know a bit more about it. It's kind of, for all sorts of reasons, I'm kind of quite attracted to the idea of books that fail. Um, but um, it's great that it's coming back now. There's a bit at the beginning of this where he's talking about the recruitment. He says, war, everyone is getting ready. Everyone is going. What is war? No one has the foggiest idea. And that's part of the reason people were so keen on it, because they didn't have any idea what the reality would be. And then there's another great uh, little observation. It says, in a few short days, civilization was wiped out. In a few short days, all of our leaders became abject failures. For their role, their only role that mattered, was precisely to prevent all this. Uh, really, really remarkable passage. Uh, but all of this stuff is slightly sort of, it's, it's quite interesting really that, you know, as, as you know, um, after uh, Henri Barbusse's uh, Under Fire, which came out in 1916, which so shaped, you know, it's, it's the real, it's the sort of template. After the war, there was this long sort of gap of silence where sort of people just, did, it seemed people didn't want to think about it. And then, really the late 20s, the early 1930s, suddenly all this stuff starts, starts coming out. And, you know, so we would, re you know, Wilfred Owen, their, their poems of, of, of protest, of course, but they were, they took their part, their place in the public consciousness with that Edmund London edition 
amid the, the larger a, a culture of bereavement rather than, than protest. And I think that, that sort of weird 10 year delay is quite interesting until you think about how publishing happens now, really. And it wasn't so different. There's a great sort of telegram from Richard Aldington to his agent talking about his book, Death of, the, uh, Death of a Hero. And he says something like, you know, it's in telegraph, it sort of telegrammies, he says something like, you know, think big war novel might go over big now in the wake of the success of <laughs> Journey's End and other, you know, so people realized, oh wow, you know, there's scope for the American version of uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, the English version. So it was a, it was a real sort of snow, snowballing, uh, snowballing effect uh, uh, as well. But I think that was also because for that, you know, period, it, it, I, I think the experience had been so traumatic that, uh, you know, for, for a while people just couldn't, you just couldn't address the, the calamity. I think any, any subject uh, of Major Moore needs its time to be addressed, in fiction at least. I think you, you can write about it as memoir or journalistically, or otherwise it has to, I mean, settle into the soul and come out in, a, in another form. I mean, you, I think even today we haven't seen the real 9-11 books, for example, yet. They're still to come. Um, well, so that's... We could talk about that. Yeah, but that's a, that's <laughs> well, I, I, I thought it might be nice for me to tell people about Justin's book because he's too modest, probably, and nobody knows what he's written, and I've read it, and it's fantastic. He's written a novel called The Steady Running of the Hour, which comes from a poem by Wilfred Owen, which one of you can probably recite a line from. I couldn't. Okay, you don't have to. <laughs> but, the is, but it takes the form of a young guy in San Francisco who gets a mysterious phone call. He may have an inheritance. His great-great-grandparents May have, the father, the male parent who may or may not have married his great great grandmother, has left a huge fortune. So he's essentially having to go to Europe to try to track through correspondence and history uh, the facts. He has a limited amount of time to find out if he does is heir to this fortune. But in recreating uh, the romance between the man and the woman in the wartime era, he has a, an epistolary, uh, you know, uh, there's a correspondence going on that brings a lot of the things we've been talking about into the fore in a, in, this, in a subtle way because the man is in the war, but the man is also uh, a, a climber who goes to Everest. And that interested me for two reasons. One is that um, Robert Graves in his book, Goodbye to All That, talks much of his friendship with George Mallory, who also fought in the war and went to Everest and died there. And also because in your book, The Missing of the Sum, you begin pretty early by talking about Scott's doomed expedition to the South Pole. And I'm just wondering, what is it about these, uh, these British men uh, throwing themselves into the war and hurling themselves at snow caps <laughs> to perish? Um, how does it, how did it inform, both of, why did you both care? Well, I mean, in a, in a, in, I mean, in a sense to answer that question, it would be lovely now if I could say, and now I'm <laughs> happy to introduce our special surprise guest, Mr. Wade Davis. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, I mean, that amazing uh, book by, by Wade Davis, the title of which is now escaping me. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, <laughs> The Great Silence, is it? Uh, Into the Enter the Silence. Enter the Silence. Anyway, so what mm -hmm. it is, um, he, he was, you know, he was researching uh, George Mallory and Irving's uh, attempt to, uh, to get to the summit of Everest, and then he discovered that something like some incredible number of the uh, members of the first four Everest uh, uh, expeditions had served in, uh, you know, either on the Western Front or at Gallipoli. They had these incredible kind of just this incredible. They, they got used to this. Uh, just yeah, I, I'll put it like this. They got used to living in the death zone, uh, and uh, yeah, he he sort of. Reconceives the narrative of the of the the the, um, the, the beginning of the conquest of, of Everest in terms of that sort of uh, traumatic experience of the of the First World War. So I, I think that's uh, that that's an important thing. I think with Scott as well. I mean that's a very British thing. You've got this. You know, you, uh, I know there's a lot of debate about you know how the extent to which Scott was thoroughly incompetent. But I think you've got that, you've got there the beginning of this incredible sort of British uh, celebration and culture of failure. Um, so, you know, um, which uh, it lives on to this day. Well, right, yeah. I mean, you think, you think of Scott, 
you think of Scott in the summer, it's almost the same thing. Uh, indeed. And I mean, even Shackleton, I mean, the, 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 the Shackleton's very famous for having saved his men, which was this tremendous achievement to bring back his men who had all been stranded on the ice. And they got back in, they were in 1916, and some of them were promptly killed in the war. Um, after this miraculous, you know, this journey that had preserved them. But, but yeah, yeah, as Jeff was saying, the Everest expeditions are fascinating because these people literally had wounds. There was one guy on the 1924 expedition named Hazard who actually had open wounds. They should never have let him that high up. They were, would start to bleed. He wasn't one of the, good, the better climbers when, when he got um, to the higher camps. But I mean, it tells you something about the, the, um, the culture of the time that, that he would have been allowed to be on the, on the expeditions because the war service was sort of valued, but it was also this you know, I don't know, it was something that they all had in common and you, you didn't want to exclude somebody who had sort of, sort of shown their mettle in the war. But I, I do think that the part of it is also your, what you're looking at here is, is the, this, you know, the British Empire is this, the greatest empire the world had ever seen, also sort of shrinking and, and almost like an overcompensating effort to reach the third pole in Everest. But <laughs> at the same time that, that Britain's, you know, the, the war was in some sense showed the limitations of its power and the U.S. stepping in and changes in um, sort of the global landscape, um, Britain was still very powerful. And I, I feel like that intersection between the, this old world and the new is part of what makes that, the war so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Josie, may I, um, there was a great essay by Josh Packer in the New Yorker recently about war, um, the war literature. And one thing he writes is, it's a redemptive understanding of their capacity for good and evil, both, and of the way that war, more than any other human, uh, or that war, more than any other human endeavor, leaves them nowhere to hide. And to me, I think that is part of the fascination of war literature, or why we write still about war so much. You're out where um, everything is about life and death, and often, otherwise, when you write about modern lives. Actually, a lot is chitter chat somehow. Um, but when you get to the crux of the matter and the decisions people take um, are life and death for themselves, for the people around them, you are somewhere at the core of, of the living being. Um, I've written myself about the, the Bosnian genocide in one of my novels. And during the writing of it, uh, I lost my memory. I mean, I really got total amnesia and had to live with my sister for a while to slowly get it back into, you know, several weeks before I could just read even basic things and a full year to come around. And um, since then, I learned to keep a certain distance to my own characters, uh, not to disappear in them like that. But it's always with me this thing that I don't want to write about something that that's less important. Uh, and I worked, before I, I wrote, I worked in the peace provinces of the UN in the war-torn countries. And saw a lot of things that I, to this day, cannot write about. Um, and what I wonder about when we talk about the literature of, of the First World War is how so many actually did write about things they experienced. I mean, when I wrote about war myself, I wrote about the Boston Genocide because I could not write, for example, about the war in Mozambique, where I had experienced you know, a lot of really brutal things and seen the war. Um, I had to, like, take it somewhere else when I should approach it. And I don't know how you see that the people who were that close to it, people who have been in the trenches, whether as soldiers or as poets, were able still to address it quite quite early, I think. Well, I think it's, it's, it's a really fascinating distinction to make between the people who chose to write about it 10 years later and the people who are writing about it at the moment. Clearly, uh, Wilfred Owen had um, not published anything. He published only five poems in, in a small magazine went before he died. So he had no expectation, really, when he started. He, it would have been unreasonable to suppose that, that he was suddenly going to become super famous, even if he wanted that. So it's quite different from the situation uh, that Jeff was describing with Richard Arlington sending a telegram saying, OK, I'm, it's 10 years after the fact, and now I'm going to write about this war that already happened. So I think that for some of these people, I mean, for, in, in Owen's case, he, you know, he found his voice in the war, and I think it was therapeutic. Frankly, I mean, he wrote a lot of this stuff when he was in a mental hospital. Um, and so I think um, the experience of writing it like, did help. So I, I don't know. But at the same time, I'm sure, I'm sure that some people, 10 years on, I'm not sure I would want to revisit it. I know that in Sassoon's case, evidently, he had memo uh, nightmares about the war well up into the 30s and 40s. My knowledge of Siegfried Sassoon and mm -hmm. Wilfred Owen comes from reading 
well, basically Pat Barker's regeneration, and in that novel, which I'm sure is drawn from the correspondence between the men, she, there's not a, she didn't make that up, uh, Siegfried Sassoon has to tell Wilfred Owen that he should be writing about the war, because Wilfred Owen says, no, 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 poetry isn't supposed to be about these gruesome things I've experienced, it's supposed to be about beauty and ennobling man, and Sassoon says, think it over, you know, you've got it wrong. And I, I, I don't know if one of you can speak to, <laughs> that's true, right? Uh, oh yeah, it's, it's very, it's very uh, obviously derived from the sort of correspondence. And it's, it's funny for me, that book, I mean, I, it's, uh, I know the Regeneration trilogy was very, very popular, but I'm struck by the way, uh, now what's happening, I think this is, you know, it's, it's perhaps, it's another version of that Aldington phenomenon with the, uh, you know, with the centenary coming up, publishers were on the lookout for, for books about uh, the First World War. But what I'm struck by now, it seems, I mean, I didn't think much of the Pat Barker Regeneration Trilogy, to be honest, but, I mean, there's a, a number of books that have come out recently uh, in the realm of non-fiction about the First World War, which are so original and forward-looking in their form about this event that took place 100 years ago. And I'll just mention a couple of them. I mean, this, uh, we were meant to, he was, he was meant to be here tonight. This amazing book by a guy whose name I can't even pronounce, Florian Illes. 1913, the year before the storm. And it's this great sort of fragmentary account of everything that was going on just before the First World War happened, you know, that idyllic period. And what it really brings out is that, wow, this was kind of real, you know, firecracking, heyday, modernism, this kind of stuff. It's so, so original. Um, really almost unprecedented in form, uh, although I think it borrows somewhat from the, the really you know, the, 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 the uh, Nicholson Baker book, Human Smoke, about the, the period building up to the Second World War. But also I wanted to mention this book by Peter England called, is it called The Sorrow and the Beauty? The Beauty and the Sorrow? Uh, what he does, he tracks, he takes 10 real life people and tracks what they were doing on, on a particular day. And so it's a really new way of writing narrative. Uh, and it really reconfigures the First World War for a quite, in a quite sort of interesting way. So, 1st of July, 1916, if you're English, that means one thing, you know, the first day of the Somme. Now, it happens that none of the people that Peter England was following, they weren't at the Somme on the 1st day of, uh, on the 1st of July, 1916. And that really is quite a, you know, it makes us sort of British people realize, oh God, yeah, there was stuff going on elsewhere, you know, in Russia and all this kind of stuff. On the other hand, there's a, a sort of downside to this. Um, you know, in recent years on TV, there have been a lot of this, as all this kind of color footage has been unearthed, you get this, these programs, you know, the Second World War in color. And of course, what that means is that the whole narrative of the war is reconfigured according to who had color film. <laughs> So, not surprisingly, poor bankrupt England, our role in the Second World War comes close to disappearing. <laughs> Good news for you lot, it turns out, yeah, America. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, so that's, uh, that, that's uh, but I think it's always useful to have our sort of, the, the narratives that we rather passively or, yeah, passively accept, sh shaken up like that. Anyway, so, I think there's a kind of period of kind of, renaissance modernism going on in non-fiction writing about the, the, the First World War now. So these, these books are incredibly original, I find, as opposed to a weary old, weary old bit of sort of regeneration from Pat Barker. So maybe it's in a good moment opinion. to have some reading then and some examples of this. I don't, Lisa, would you start with reading some of it? Well, I'm not reading from Pat Barker. So. No, 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 but, no, 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 but, um, um, I'm going to read from Vera Britton, and uh, she's well known in England, but I thought American re audiences might not have heard much about her. Uh, she's the young woman who was an early feminist, got herself into Oxford, uh, to Somerville, where Robert Graves ended up being for a while after the war. But uh, she wrote a memoir that she didn't publish until 1933 because her grief was so utter and absolute that she couldn't face thinking about this for quite a while, but um, I'm going to read three paragraphs from different points in her life during the war to give you a feeling 
of who she was. Uh, one is about the moment, the eve of her fiance, Roland, who's a very pompous young man, uh, who she loved. I'm not trying to knock him, but he was pompous. I liked Roland. <laughs> there you go. Um, going off to uh, going off to the war, and she, although she's gotten herself into Oxford with great difficulty, immediately wants to serve and signs up to be a ba a bad. And so she's, you know, sh she believes in duty too. But so this is her going with him to the train as he's about to leave. Um, she says. I too wanted to find no angel after the war, after the flood, after the grave. I wanted the arrogant, egotistic, vital young man that I loved. The next day I saw him off, although he said that he would rather I didn't come. In the early morning we walked to the station beneath the dazzling sun, but the platform from which his train went out was dark and very cold. In the railway carriage we sat hand in hand until the whistle blew. We never kissed and never said a word. I got down from the carriage still clasping his hand and held it until the gathering speed of the train made me let go. He leaned through the window, looking at me with sad, heavy eyes, and I watched the train wind out of the station and swing round the curve until there was nothing left but the snowy distance and the sun shining harshly on the bright, empty rails. I can scarcely bear to think of him, I wrote in my diary, and yet I cannot bear to think of anything else. For the time being, all people, all ideas, all interests have set and sunk below the horizon of my mind. He alone I can contemplate, whom of all things in heaven and earth it hurts to think about most. Certainly the war was already beginning to overshadow scholarship and ambition, but I was not ready yet to give in to it. I wanted very badly to be heroic, or at any rate to seem heroic to myself, so I tried hard to rationalize my grief. I felt, I endeavored subsequently to assure myself, a weak and cowardly person to shrink from my share in the universal sorrow. After all, it was only right that I should have to suffer too, that I had no longer an impersonal indifference to set me apart from the thousands of breaking hearts in England today. It was my part to face the possibility of a ruined future with the same courage that he is going to face death. Now that's what she told herself as he went off to war in March of 1915. He died that December. Uh, her brother died like the next year and then everyone else died. It's so hard to talk about these things without becoming absolutely overcome, for me at least. But so uh, after serving on a remote island, and keeps on getting blown up, the, the things she subjects her to are quite masochistic. She wants to feel she's suffering as badly as the men. But uh, she finally is going to die a soldier who's been blinded, to marry a soldier who's been blinded out of pity, but then he dies. And so she asks to be sent to active fighting in France, and she goes off near Boulogne. This is in 1917. This is an overview of hers, which, is, it appears in many of the other overviews that I've mentioned, like Fussell, that we've all been talking about. This is her overview. Between 1914 and 1919, young men and women, disastrously pure in heart and unsuspicious of elderly self-interest and cynical exploitation, were continually rededicating themselves, as I did that morning in Boulogne, to an end that they believed, and went on trying to believe, lofty and ideal. When patriotism wore threadbare, when suspicion and doubt began to creep in, the more ardent and frequent was the periodic rededication, the more deliberate the self-induced conviction that our efforts were disinterested and our cause was just. Undoubtedly, this state of mind was what anti-war propagandists call it, hysterical exaltation, quasi-mystical, idealistic hysteria. But it had concrete results in stupendous patience, in superhuman endurance, and the constant reaffirmation of incredible courage. To refuse to acknowledge this is to underrate the power of those white angels which fight so naively on the side of destruction. So that's her war. And then the final thing, and then I'll stop, is a paragraph when everyone is electrified by the arrival, the tardy arrival of the Americans. This is what it seemed like Europeans in the late summer of 1917 when the Americans finally bothered to join the war. That was because the Germans were, U-boats were bombing us in that spring, so they finally joined. So she sees the, the soldiers approaching their camp. They were swinging rapidly towards Camier, and though the sight of soldiers marching was now too familiar to arouse curiosity, an unusual quality of bold vigor in their swift stride caused me to stare at them with puzzled interest. They looked larger than ordinary men. Their tall, straight figures were in vivid contrast to the undersized armies of pale recruits to which we had grown accustomed. At first, I thought their spruce, clean uniforms were those of officers. Yet obviously, they could not be officers, for there were too many of them. They seemed, as it were, Tommies in heaven. 
Had yet another regiment been conjured out of our depleted dominions, I wondered, watching them move with such rhythm, such dignity, such serene consciousness of self-respect. But I knew the colonial troops so well, and these were different. They were assured where the Australians were aggressive, self-possessed where the New Zealanders were turbulent. Then I heard an excited exclamation from a group of sisters behind me. Look, look, here are the Americans. I pressed forward with the others to watch the United States physically entering the war, so godlike, so magnificent, so splendidly unimpaired in comparison with the tired, nerve-wracked men of the British Army. So these were our deliverers at last, marching up the road to Camier in the spring sunshine. There seemed to be hundreds of them, and in the fearless swagger of their proud strength, they looked as formidable, they looked a formidable bulwark against the peril looming from Amiens. Um, my eyeballs pricked, my throat ached, and a mist swam over the confident Americans going to the front. The coming of relief made me realize all at once how long and how intolerable had been the tension, and with the knowledge that we were not, after all, defeated, I found myself beginning to cry. That's Vera Britton from Testament of Youth. Very strong. Uh, Justin, would you go for to give us a little surprise for us at the end? Uh, oh, really? <laughs> but Justin, you go first. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have time. Yeah, I'm going to read a letter. Well, it's good. We were, we've been talking about Wolf Dawn all night, um, and I, I didn't know that we would, but obviously I really like him because I gave the title of my book on one of his poems. And um, his letters were a big thing for me. Uh, they were really my way into this whole world. Um, and, and I've read, you know, I've read a lot of them. And th this one I've had, you know, I've, I've actually l l recently seen them in person because they happen to be in Austin. Um, and, that they're, and this letter that I'm going to read you is his last letter. Uh, Wilfred Owen was actually killed about a week before the armistice. Well, exactly a week, actually, that because um, he was killed on the 4th of November, 1918. Um, so he didn't know when he was writing this letter that it was going to be his last letter. Um, and there's a sort of magic to it. But there's a magic to all his letters. This one's just magical in the sense that he didn't know that. He wrote his mother very frequently. The post between England and France went very quickly. quickly. Um, and uh, he was uh, in a cellar. Well, I'll, you'll, you'll know where he is from the, from the letter. Um, but uh, the legend, which is, I, I, I was trying to make sure that this was true when I was looking today, and I think it's true, is that that his mother got the, the news of, of his death, the actual telegram arrived when the uh, bells of the armistice were ringing um, in his hometown. Um, so this is October 31st, Thursday, 6.15 uh, p.m. It's dated even to the hour. Dearest mother, I will call the place from which I am now writing the smoky cellar of the Forester's house. I write on the first sheet of writing pad which came in the parcel yesterday. Luckily the parcel was small, as it reached me just before we moved off the line, off to the line. Thus only the paraffin was unwelcome in my pack. My servant and I ate the chocolate in the cold middle of the last night, crouched under a draughty tambu roofed with planks. I husband the malted milk for tonight and tomorrow night. The handkerchiefs and socks are most opportune, as the ground is marshy and I have a slight cold. So thick is the smoke in the cellar that I can hardly see by a candle 12 inches away and so thick are the inmates that I can hardly move for pokes, nudges, or jolts. On my left, the company commander snores on a bench. Other officers repose on wire beds behind me. At my right hand, Kellett, a delightful old servant of A Company in the old days, radiates joy and contentment from peak pink cheeks and baby eyes. He laughs with a signaler whose left ear is glued to the receiver, but whose right ear, rolling with gaiety, showed that he is listening to a merry corporal who appears this distance away, some three feet, nothing but a gleam of white teeth and a wheeze of jokes. Splashing my hand, an old soldier with a walrus mustache peels and dumps potatoes into the pot. By him keys my cook, chops wood. Another feeds the fire with damp wood. It is a great life. I am more oblivious than I'll ask yourself, dear mother, of the ghastly glimmering of the guns outside and the hollow crashing of the shells. There is no danger here, or if any, it will be over before you read these lines. I hope you are as warm as I am, as serene in your room as I am here, and that you think of me never in bed as resignedly as I think of you always in bed. Of this I am certain you could not be visited by a band of friends half so fine as surround me here, ever, Wilfred.
Ah, okay. So, um, Deb already gave us about a letter. Maybe you should have a letter that hasn't been published yet. Yeah, so. it's, a, it's a thing that we're un I, it's all a bit ambiguous about whether I had permission to, to read this anyway, and time has marched on. So, uh, so well, we're ready to take questions. I mean, we, we could have, I mean, have the moment to read it. It's not a problem okay, with the time. It's, it's just that we're open uh, to yeah, questions. Yeah, that, but if you have a right, yeah. So if anybody has any questions, we have a microphone on either side. So unfortunately, we can't come around with the microphone, so, but come up, and then we take the questions. mentioned about the ruling class. Uh, that's kind of hinted at the letter in terms of the cook and the yeah. officer and so forth. But I think that was very important in this war because it was a perfect storm of the, the old way the ruling class conducted the war, then modern technology, and also what was not mentioned was the media and how the media, <coughs> which was modern, relatively to previous times fanned uh, the flame of patriotism and, and war and, and, and nationalism. So I'd, I'd like you to speak about those three components. Yeah, yeah you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, in a sense, the, the Russian Revolution comes, is, is, a, is sort of hastened on by, by the First World War. Uh, yeah, it's really striking, isn't it, hearing all this talk of, of servants and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and I think, yeah, the, the First World War does, it represents the beginning of the, of the end of that, uh, of that culture of, uh, of deference uh, and obedience, and it represents the beginning of the sort of end of the, uh, of the, of, of the, of the British Empire. And, of course, it's an American writer who puts this most beautifully, isn't it, in that famous passage from Tender is the Night, when Dick Diver takes them on that tour of the, uh, I can't remember which bit of the Western Front it is, but he says, you know, this couldn't be done again. I can't remember the exact words, but at one point he says, you know, this took blah, 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 and the exact, relation, the exact relations between the classes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's absolutely uh, the, the um, yeah. It, well, wouldn't it be great if we could have said, yeah, it was the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the ruling classes, but of course, as we know, they have an incredible ability to, uh, to, uh, to uh, reconfigure themselves. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I would say in the case of, of Wolf and Owen, a lot of these people, Sassoon was different. They were sort of like in this mid-level it's not a very pleasant situation, actually, to have been a subaltern in the Western Front. Your, your life expectancy would have been two, two months or something at the bad point. And you were in command of 60 men, and you were expected to be incredibly brave. And I think you can see those pressures. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the play Journey's End. You see that the just kind of the, these people being ground down between uh, a world that, you know, they had gone to public school, and so they were brought up to be this particular person. But they were not really running the show, most of them. So. Um, I think there was a, a sort of definitely a class resentment, but probably there was a, what, you, what comes out in the literature, of course, is the generational resentment, right? Between the younger and the older people, between um, those people who were sort of, had seen nothing of the world but the hypocrisy that they encountered when they went there. But um, I, yeah, I think uh, uh, the media is also a really important thing because, of course, this, is, this was the beginning of the era in which public opinion became a real thing. Um, and, in the discussion you see about how we arrived at 1914, a lot of it is about um, people not really understanding, um, you know, the, the, the Kaiser suddenly thinking, oh, it's suddenly being aware that, that, that they have to think about public opinion or being indifferent to it, but dealing with it. But of course, you can see the way that the sort of war propaganda machine affected um, people's perceptions. I think the First World War might have been the last war in which it was really possible, though, to, to believe that things were, as were kind of rosy at the beginning, because once war got back, you know, how could anybody really think war was that easy after they heard what the sum or what these places were like? And addressing specifically the class difference, Robert Graves is so good at it. He's in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and he's been serving for a year commanding men with insane orders that caused the deaths of more than half of his company. And some superior officer comes in and chews him out because men are wearing their uniforms slackly. And, uh, you know, the people who, in some little German French town where they're billeted, they start playing soccer because when they play cricket 
he's so offended that the regulars who play cricket are kicked out when toffs come visiting from the front, you know, who are more aristocratic. So there was, uh, you know, so he, he definitely, but he was a member of the upper classes. He did have servants, so that does appear in the books. But you don't sense, I don't at least, in reading a whole lot of these books over the last month or two, uh, that there was that much active, you'd, I didn't sense so much resentment of the hierarchy until the fact was that Lauren Haig was stupid and they realized they were being killed. But like on the ground, it seems that people still were so under the spell of the old class hierarchies that they really didn't, they were in a way comforting or, or they were familiar. Yeah, in this letter that I was gonna read, um, there's this incredible bit where one of the sergeants yells to this officer who's writing the letter. He says, if you're worried about us, sir, don't worry, we'll go through hell for you, sir. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that that remained uh, that remained pretty pretty well intact. I'm struck by the kind of continuities in this, though. So of course, it seems so absurd that there was this fuss made about the you know keeping the uniforms spick and span. But you'll remember that great bit in Evan Wright's in the book uh, Generation Kill by Evan Wright and the TV series about that uh, platoon of regiment of recon marines in uh, in Iraq. There's that. Marine sergeant or whatever he is, and he keeps appearing, going on about you've got to maintain the grooming standard. So there it is. That's going on in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, and, and also the rosiness. You remember from the first Gulf War, how all the media teams they were like embedded in you know certain parts of, of the army and did not see all what was happening really. So they didn't see the actual killings. They saw you know the pictures part of it all the time. So then it became more difficult with the second part of the war to do so, but you know, the, the soldiers come back in uh, body bags. But initially there is this, even with modern media, that tendency also. Yeah, and, and we shouldn't exaggerate how modern the media was 1914 to 18. I mean, it was being heavily edited. It, there wasn't the age of the citizen journalist. There's this, this a point when Robert Graves is so happy to read the German uh, newspapers, which were a bit franker than the British ones, and finds out actually what's been happening in recent activity. But he gets back to London and isn't just infuriated at the ignorance of the, of the citizens. People don't actually know what's been going on. The worst is hidden from them. Uh, and he gets very upset at the civilians. Maybe it's Sassoon gets upset at the civilians who just care about what happens to them in London and are indifferent, actually, to what's happening over there. Well, I think you go first here. soldiers or people who had otherwise participated. And I'm curious about how contemporary writers abridge that uh, experiential and temporal and sometimes cultural gap between themselves and uh, the people who took part in the war. Um. <laughs> Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> Actually, maybe I'll say something here, having written a lot about war, not about the First World War, but. Um, since I have worked with wars, though I've not been in the front, um, I do feel I draw a lot from personally what, I, what mm -hmm. I've seen and experienced. I've been held up and attacked many times and thought I wouldn't get away from it with, with my life. Um, so, yeah, I've not been in trenches and, um, or bombed, but, but I feel I've been close enough that I, that I can write about it. And the other part is you you have to talk to people and, and listen. Uh, and then then you can live yourself into it and write about it. But always, of course, with that respect, what you haven't experienced, you really haven't. So then when I wrote about, about Bosnia, I, I did not I, uh, have the audacity to write directly from the point of view, for example, of a Bosnian who were encountering in, in a concentration camp. So it's there, but, but from the outside. And the same when I've been writing about things in Africa, I see it, you know, from angles that I feel I know enough about to write about. Um, but I think it, it differs, and it, it, you know, Justin can talk about how to write about yeah, the First World War living today, because that you haven't experienced, but still it's possible, I think, to live yourself into things. Sure, I mean, just as you were saying, I think the act of writing fiction, a lot of it is about taking what you know from your own life, no matter how much you research. I mean, I could invent characters and 
in ancient Greece or something, but when there's a love story there, you're probably going to use what you think or you know about love and what you think you know about people. Um, and in the case of the war, I think, you know, in, but I think that as a non-combatant writing about war, I think, you know, there's something, I don't know, obviously there's a tradition of, you know, people have done it, you know, the Brett Badge of Courage and all that, it's, it's, it's something that happens, but you do feel, it, maybe it's easier almost to write about a war that happened 100 years ago because there's no longer anybody to, around to tell me. You know, if I was writing a novel about Iraq or Afghanistan, it'd be a lot trickier because there are people around here who, who have more right, you would say, to write about it. But um, maybe in, in another sense, though, it made me overcompensate. So I, I felt a lot of pressure to get it right, and that sort of informs like, your level of research, your level of like, kind of immersion. And so I, I tried to immerse myself. But I think in the end, it's not, um, it's not a research project. A lot of it is about imagination. So you try to learn as much as you can, and then kind of close your eyes and, and work from your imagination. And a couple of weeks ago, the French novelist Jean Ichnos was in New York, and uh, he's written, won the Prix Goncourt, he's written so much. But he came up with a novel called 1914 that just came out this year, uh, which was inspired. I said, did you write that because it was going to be the centenary? And he said, no, not at all. I'd forgotten about it. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about World War I. It's just my, I think it was his wife, had an uncle who was a pilot. And it was very daring and very dangerous to be a pilot in the early days of flying. They were easy targets, they didn't fly very high, they were blown, down, blown, blown to bits a lot of the time. But so he, you know, when you read it now, you do sense that even though, it, he doesn't really, he's telling the story, but a modern sensibility creeps in when he says something wry in retrospect about something. So I, I just think that each writer has his own voice and, uh, and that the war, if they choose the field of World War I, they'll, exercise it in that um, with, with, with total freedom and, and without, it, it's not the same as having seen it firsthand, though it's, it's imagination. Although, yeah, often, I'm sorry, one last point, I would say that like um, A Farewell to Arms or something, I mean, Hemingway wasn't at a lot of the things that he, you know, his, his war experience was chiefly limited to like uh, getting bombed while he was, I mean, in the, in the novel, he, the character says, I was like cutting a piece of cheese while the bombardment happened. Like he, he, you know, people, a lot of these guys, like Faulkner came back from the war, from World War I, wearing an RAF uniform, even though he'd never flown. I mean, writers tend to be sort of self-aggrandizing liars who make up stories, so, so you, you, so maybe it does, it does and it doesn't matter. Sorry. But no, I still think today, what is different is that with the body of literature that exists about war, it's, I mean, you cannot romanticize in the same way as, as you could in the past. I mean, you'll be called upon it. I mean, that's then also what you're up against when you do research, that's in, because you're, you know, maybe nobody remembers the war, but there's so much literature that people will hold you to account for that. Maybe we should take the next, uh, probably make it the last question. Um, uh, thank you. Um, to my more learned <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know that. Or do we have to pass on that one? Yeah, I'm sorry. So, so, so uh, sorry. I'm sorry that we've ended on a note of some chronic <laughs> defeat. <I'm laughs> <not gonna say. laughs> um, anyway, then I think I'll end with one last question before I, each one of you briefly. Um, if we look at history, literature about the First World War didn't seem to do anything to prevent the Second World War, uh, 
But what is it then that war literature can give us and do, or should we do anything? And, and can it help us find peace? Well, I, I mean, I think I'll sort of dodge that bullet slightly and go back to a previous question. I mean, uh, you know, in the last 10 years or so, some of the greatest war writing ever, I think, has been, has been published. Uh, at, at the risk of rehearsing something I've already sort of said in the past, it just happens that it's not come in the form of the novel, which is where we've been led to expect it to come. It's, uh, it's come in the form of this incredible kind of, uh, you know, long form reportage that's coming out of, uh, 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 it's overwhelmingly American actually. It's partly because of the amazing resources of these magazines that can send people to, you know, to, to places for a long period of time. And uh, what I was gonna say in re response to the other question is you know, about uh, people's experience of it. Well, let's say people like, uh, like Owen, you know, he, he wrote about his experience, but what we've had as a result of this uh, policy of, it, of um, what do you call it, embodiment, not, um, what, what do you call it? When, uh, Embedding. Embedding, that's right, yeah. Where, you know, which everyone initially thought this is incredibly compromising, but what's happened is these incredibly accomplished reporters have lived incredibly closely with, uh, with soldiers, shared the same dangers, and out of that have come, you know, these incredible books. I'll just mention sort of two or three of them. Of course, The, the Good Soldiers by David Finkel, uh, Dexter Filkin's The Forever War, uh, Evan Wright's Generation Kill, which, which I mentioned, and these are, these are amazing books, and it's, um, what they do is they, they, they're very frank about the kind of excitement and the amazing, the sort of the, uh, you know, the, the kind of intensity of the experience and the awfulness of it, uh, and the two, are, the, two are, the two are dealt with very, very frankly, but I think this is a, you know, we are living through a golden age of, of war writing. It's just not come in a, until very recently, uh, until, with the exception of maybe the Ben Fountain book and uh, Phil Clay's deployment, it's tended not to come in in the form of fiction. Mm. We just have to hope that Putin will read some of it and refrain <laughs> from us knowing too many wars. Lisa, what do you say? Can war writing help prevent more wars? On the evidence, it hasn't. <laughs> um, you know, the fear was brought out, was written in 1930, but they had to suppress it because the Second World War came about and uh, the you know, governments didn't want to demoralize the people, so the book was suppressed. <laughs> and uh, and sort of, that's sort of a sign that they thought maybe the book could do something, but I don't know how you stop the machine of war because someone has written a searing book. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, as, as Jeff said, uh, f fantastic writing is coming out of wars that are happening, that have been happening recently. There is something about uh, a testing experience that cannot help attracting the attention. And I, I think that you don't know what the book is going to do to the person who reads it. But I think that the, the more arresting and disturbing the experience, the more that will, that can come out of it. And I think when you look at the tremendous body of literature that has arisen from the letters and poems, not even that many poems, uh, and uh, of just a handful of people we've been talking about tonight, you see how much bigger they are than their core. There's something that they signify that's larger. Mm. And what do you say, Justin? Um, well, I, I, I do think that something has changed and that I, I think the idea that war, I think that the, the literature we've been discussing has probably created a basic assumption that war is really terrible. I think we owe that partly to the First World War's literature and the fact that, that this small group of people who made this stuff has given us the idea that, that, that we can expect this kind of harvest of death if we are completely you know, ignorant about um, you know, what's going to happen. But on the other hand, of course, you know, it's no longer that literature isn't the dominant medium in the, what, the way that it was in the late 1920s. And so we would have to see something of, of similar quality come out of Hollywood or something, or, or a television for it to be, to be pervasive and to be meaningful in the same way. But I, I do think that you know, what makes the, the First World War so important is you see the, the collision of both that, that 
the poetic voice and the imagination and a generation of people raised on books who, who had the, the gift of expressing themselves and the shock of this thing. And um, it's, a, it's an, an opportunity for us to look at this you know, generation after generation because its, it's relevance is, is continual. But as to whether it will produce, you know, prevent wars, of course it won't. But um, as, as to whether it's you know, one of the best, you know, the best things to look at if you're thinking about war, yeah. I mean, part of it, of course, will always have to do with whether the, what the underlying message is, whether there's any culpability. You know, if we just look at the First World War as an, as an act of complete chance and we were struck by lightning, or if we look at it as, you know, men made this happen. Um, this, could, this didn't have to happen. What was the result of it? You know, what, what did it prevent? What, you know, th those kinds of questions have to be asked hand in hand with the experience of suffering. It's not just a, an exercise in sort of pornographic violence. It, it has to be accompanied by some real perspective and, and questions of whatever it is, whether it's Iraq or, or uh, Passchendaele. So I, I, but I do think that that, that kind of inspiring that sense of propulsion of things that are real is tremendously important. Yeah, yeah I mean, if we can learn what the mechanisms are, when people fight and make wars, we can also learn the mechanisms of peace. So I think with that, um, we'll end the talk of the Great War with hopes for great peace, extended mm -hmm. peace. And I want to thank this excellent panel, and thank everybody for being here. Thank you.